We would like to thank you for coming today and sharing some of your experiences with us. Yes, thank you for having me. <laughs> So when and where were you born? I was born in Lufkin, Texas, in a little place called Cedar Grove, on the outskirts of Lufkin, Texas. And when? Uh, when were you born? I was born May 30th, 1948. So what were your parents' occupations? Uh, my mother, she was a housewife and my father he worked odd uh, jobs but his main job he worked for the uh, Lufkin uh, what is it called uh, now it's called uh, the highway department back then we call it the highway department but he worked for the city of Lufkin <laughs> so did you have any siblings yes I have uh, seven brothers and three sisters Wow um. So, what were you doing before you entered the service? I uh, just graduated out of high school. I graduated uh, May of 1967, and I went in service in June of 1967. So, did you have any other family members who served in the military? Uh, yes, my oldest brother, he was in the Army during the uh, Korean War, and a brother older than me also my next oldest brother Charles he was in Vietnam in 1965 and 1966 mm -hmm. and I have another younger brother that was in the army but uh, it wasn't a war going on at that time okay. well <coughs> did you have any other uh, relatives uncles or uh, grandfather who was in the service uh, yes, our, my mother, brother, was our, in the Army, was one of the Tuskegee Airmen. Really? Yes, he was a lieutenant colonel in the Army after, he, after they switched over mm -hmm. after the Tuskegee incident. So how did how did all this affect your going into the the Marine Corps? Uh, at that time, uh, we didn't know too much about what was going on for his war. Mm -hmm. But we grew up Baptist faith from babies all the way up to graduating high school. We went to church and. We just felt like that was our, our duty. Some of us, our duties. Our mother brothers went to the military. They, the ones that tried, they couldn't go through boot camp. Oh. But everyone tried, right. except my youngest brother, which got killed oh. in a car accident. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, uh, how did you choose the Marine Corps? Uh, I chose the Marines because my brother was in the Army, and he was a parachute. And I didn't want to jump. Okay. I didn't want to jump out of a plane <laughs> in Vietnam at the time. I didn't know that what was required of people if they went in particular services. But I felt like the Marines, I didn't know, heard of the Marines jumping out of airplanes. So I chose the Marines. <laughs> so you were trying to avoid something. Yes, and I had some uncles that was in the Navy also. Oh. And I didn't want to go in the Navy also. Okay, <laughs> so I didn't like by elimination. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, were you drafted or did you oh, enlist? No, I, I joined with a buddy of mine. We joined together. Oh, okay. And so how did that come about? How did y'all decide to do that? Uh, we was you best were friends and we just, uh, uh, at that time the draft was going on. Yes. 1966, uh -huh. 1967. So what we did, we, uh, we volunteered early. Yes. And, but we had to graduate from high school. Right. And after graduation, we was we had orders to go straight to boot camp. Oh. So we chose the Marines. Uh, me and him, uh, class of 1967, and a couple more other guys that was uh, went into the Marine Corps earlier. So mm -hmm. we joined together as a buddy, buddy, buddy. Okay. 
And uh, so now, where did uh, where did you go to boot camp? And and tell us how you got there. I went to boot camp From in Luff. Paris Island. Oh, you went oh. And yes, I, my we my buddy went to San Diego, California. And you went to Paris Island. And I went to Paris Island. So right off the bat, it wasn't a buddy buddy system, <laughs> right. as they had told me. Right. Told us so. I uh, told my mom uh, that we was, I was when I was leaving and everything, and we got a we took a plane. And we took a bus trip to Houston to the induction center, and from there they put us on a uh, a bus and they bust us uh, straight to a Paris Island, mm-hmm. Paris Island, South Carolina, on a bus. Yes, which is unusual. Uh, because most people go to San Diego from yes, there. Yes, that's what was uh, we was told once we got to Paris Island, and everybody wanted to know why we was there. And what, and what did they say? <laughs> we had never seen a Texan before. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so so how did how did that happen? Did you ever figure it out? Uh, no, we I never did. I had spoken to him once one time before he got killed. Oh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Well. Um, uh, so how was how was it um, uh, being in boot camp? Uh, boot camp was pretty was pretty. It was fun to me. Yeah. You know because I grew up hunting squirrels, <laughs> chasing dogs, and so it was a swamp place. Yes. And so we had to do a lot of uh, walking, which I was pretty good at walking because. Of where I live, I had to do a lot of walking, mm-hmm. and so I wasn't but 140 pounds, so I was able to do most everything and anything that they had to be done. Yeah. And by being so small, uh, I became what we call a mouse. Mm-hmm. You know, anytime one of the drill instructors wanted to do something, they called for me to do it. Oh. So it was kind of a favoritism. To me, yes, like because what? they didn't pick on me as they much as they picked on other people. Yeah, right, because you were the favorite one. <laughs> yes, I yeah. was. So, so what did what did you get to do? <laughs> well, I just didn't get punished as much. Oh. Once you know, once I went through the you know t- trials and things that they did go make you go through, and or yelled at. Oh yes, yelled at and quite a few other things that uh you know that we went through i didn't smoke so that wasn't a problem for me right but some of the guys that did smoke it was hard for them because they you know they wanted to they couldn't they couldn't go through the exercises without a cigarette right and so and even though you were small you were tough yes i was pretty tough person when i was young i played football baseball i did everything i was you know, we did a lot of roughhousing when we grew up playing out in the country. Right, and, and you were, I used to shoot and rabbits and squirrels uh, and yes. things, so, so how did you fire? Uh, bad. I, I, I didn't even qualify. Really? I couldn't shoot, I couldn't hit nothing with a, with a rifle, <laughs> only a shotgun. Uh, I see, okay. <laughs> so, um, okay, so how did you like uh, basic camp? Uh, basic camp was it was good because as you go through the camp you're seeing other units graduating mm-hmm. and to see the jubilation on their face you know I couldn't go wrong I had to guy I, I couldn't wait I, you know I did everything I could do to get to make that you know because some people was falling back right. they would set you back and you wouldn't graduate you know I want to graduate on time because you know I want to be a marine absolutely so um how was it adapting to uh, to military life, the, living in the barracks and eating, you know, military food and all that stuff? Um, it was it was pretty good. It was like I say, it was one of those things that are it was like competition. Yeah. You know, you get up, you want to be the first one up when they jump out of the bed. You want to be the fastest one to tie your shoes. You want to be the fastest one to get dressed. You want to be the fastest one to put a weapon together. Everything that they ask you to do you want to be the best and so that made me that pushes that pushed me to to be the best I could be so that was everything they wanted to do I was excited and ready to do it so I can see why you were the favorite <laughs> <laughs> yeah so did you have any specialized training 
Uh, no, no specialized training other than, you know, the basic that they have you to go through. And uh, the last part of the training, we do a little hand-to-hand -hand combat training before we are uh, our last, uh, before Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, we we went through basics, you know, how to handle demolitions and, you know, what to look out for and stuff like that and different type of uh, uh, ammunition that we wasn't used to in boot camp, you know, only we had grenades in boot camp and that was it. Yeah. But, the, you know, we learned how to handle the flares and the smoke bombs and the gas masses and all that type of stuff and so it was... It was fun. And you did that in basics? Uh, yes, you had to go through that in basics. You had to go through that. You had to, uh, you know, if uh, you couldn't, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't, if you go inside of a room and they throw gas in there and you're not fast enough to put your canister on and you start coughing and stuff, you fail. You had to go again. Wow. So you had to go through that class to, in order to, you know, make it and come out you know, an emergency of, you know, a real situation, in other words, so uh, we had to learn that, and uh, we had to drown proof, we call it. Mm -hmm. uh, they throw you in the water and with, with a pack, you know, on your back and a rifle and say, don't let the rifle hit the water. Yeah. And you can't swim. And you're in a swamp. And you, yeah, if you, you know, you know, you know, and it's fun, and so you have to stay afloat. Yeah. And see, now I was a country boy, but I didn't like water. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but they threw us in ponds, you know, to run the rattlesnakes and water markets of the way where they could yeah. fish. <laughs> when, we, when, mom, when my mom went fishing, we threw jump in the water. Right. But we didn't swim. <laughs> we we just jumped in the water and made noise for, to run the rattles, the water markets of the way where they could fish. So I didn't like that part, but I had to learn how to drown proof, and that was one of the hardest things that I had to do in the military in boot camp was oh. drown proofing. Wow. So, uh, after you, and how long were you in boot camp? Uh, eight weeks. Eight weeks. Eight weeks in boot camp and uh, four more weeks uh, at, uh, at North Carolina, uh, we was in South Carolina, we went to North Carolina, Camp Lejeune for a month. Yeah. For some more, more, more like basic reading and understanding the map and stuff like that and, uh -huh. did, and then uh, all of it to Vietnam. Oh, and then you went I, to Viet to Vietnam after that. Yes, ma'am. After you stayed. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. That was my next duty station after after boot camp. Was straight to Vietnam. So, um, how about um, getting over to Vietnam and where did you serve over there? Tell us about mm. tell us about your Vietnam experience. Uh, I uh, I got to Vietnam, I think around October of 1967. And uh, somewhere around October, November, and we was on, got south of the name, and we went up to a, it's about 10 miles uh, going north. So we, the name's down south, and then we in between the name and the DMZ, which, you know, North, north Vietnam. Uh -huh. And so we, I got stationed uh, in that area called uh, Quang Nam Providence and we was uh, first battalion I was with the first battalion 7th Marines and we basically did uh, on the main hill the CP we basically learned to fill sandbags mm -hmm. we filled sandbags and clean the outhouses yeah you know that's what we did for about the first month and once we finished doing that, and then they assigned us to a squad to go out on patrols. And I went out on a patrol and got shot the first night. Really? By a sniper or? I don't know what it was. Uh, we, we, uh, we was in an ambush. Uh -huh. And so bullets was flying everywhere. And uh, I was, that was my first time out on a patrol. I carried the radio for my squad leader. Uh -huh. So I didn't didn't know what was going on uh, once the fire, once it started then next thing I know I, I was shot so I don't even know when where how but I was hit yes. and, and you know so so they got you out of the field pretty much uh, immediately yes yeah, so they got me out immediately because uh, when we got on patrol it's like this is your hill and like all of this space between these lines here is open Right. And once we get there, it's dark. 
we don't want the enemy to see us coming. Right. So we, we start out when it's just getting dark, and when we get there, we stop. And that was our first setup, mm -hmm. and that's where we got ambushed at. Oh, wow. And so by being so close to the base, oh. they sent out a squad of Marines to reinforce us and to bring me back. Yeah. Because once I got shot, me being the radio man, the radio was close by me, and they gave me morphine, so I don't know what's going on. Right. And I get a call saying who the wounded person. I answer the call, and they and to, he I told him who I was. He said, "What you doing on the phone? You don't want been shot." <laughs> and yes, I said, "We did. I need a better vac." I said, "No, sir. We don't. I don't need a better vac. It's just a good, you know, <laughs> just a warm, okay, you know." And, and he said, uh, well, we're going to send a squad out. He said, but you get off the phone let me speak to the, <laughs> to the, to the squad leader. So Paladino got the phone, and he said, yeah, he's all right. He don't need no mother back. Just send us another squad out in, some ammo and stuff, and, and he can go back with him. And that's what they did. And when I went back to my unit, I had a classmate that was in that unit. And he, he was in another patrol, another squad. And when I got to that... Constantino wanted to get back to that unit. He picked me up and took me to sick bay mm -hmm. and took that shirt off of my back and brought it home to my mom because he was over there about three months earlier than I was. Yeah. And this I didn't never see that shirt about twenty something years later. I didn't even know nothing about it. And uh I got got this shirt off. I was at uh the next day I went to the Nain Hospital, which is about ten miles away. I was in the Danane Hospital, Bob Hope, Rachel Welch, Miss World, 1967, came to the Danane Hospital and asked us who wanted to go see the Bob Hope show, and I raised my arm so tall, it looked like I guess I must have been the tallest one in there. <laughs> see you. And I went, got to see the Bob Hope show. Oh, and I was on the front line, front row, with my PJs on, right. watching the Bob Hope show, reading the cue cards as Bob Hope was reading them before he could read them. <laughs> and I learned something at that time about you know just video and stuff and uh, so I was I was glad to see that and uh, I went back to my unit back to the hospital and I had orders to go back to my unit and I got shot December 10th 1967 and I was back in my unit December 23rd or 4th before Christmas Wow! because it was Tet they needed everybody they could get uh -huh. So if he was got shot or wounded, if you didn't get wounded enough to get you out of country, they'd pass you up and send you right back. Yeah. So, and and what was your duty when you went back? Same thing, 0311, and rifleman. You, okay. Oh, you're a rifleman? Were you, did you have the radio too? Were you carrying the radio? Oh, no, when I went back, I was promoted. I'm, I've been wounded now. I'm, I, I'm, oh, you were promoted? I'm a squad leader now. Oh, okay. <laughs> so then tell us about that. About your well, experiences, I I became a squad leader and and uh, we it was like you got a well it's it's a whole it's a squad but you're not the squad leader you got a section and so you you control so many guys so many men in that section yes and so it's, it's they call it a platoon leader uh -huh. and you know, not a squad leader but a platoon you know and so we. That's basically uh, what I did. I went out on patrols. Oh, okay. Um, probably every other night, I would have to go out on patrol. Uh, you know, this here the center of the hill. One one patrol might go out this way. Another patrol might go out that way. Another patrol might go out that way. Different times. Then at the night, I might crisscross here. He might crisscross there, and we do our rendezvous, and we come back in in the mornings. And so basically that's what we did. We ran ambushes every night or every other night. We we was out ambushing or getting ambushed or, you know, if we wasn't doing that, then we was on operations, which is uh, called major operations, that we go out and we might control the whole section and, you know, have a perimeter set around. Then we come in the center, and then we work our way back out to our men on the outside. Anything in between is ours. Right. And we went out on operations like that for uh, 
weeks, maybe four or five days, six or seven days at a time. Uh, certain, uh, certain ones uh, entail certain different things. You know, we are, uh, sometimes we didn't see the enemy, but we ran through a lot of booby traps, right. mines and stuff like that. And then sometimes we have to go out on operation when we had to go up in the mountains. We had to go through the jungle, cut the, get through only with a machete. And uh, we, sometimes we go on operation where we bop, drop in, drop napalm, drop in Agent Orange and burn everything up. And then we go into that spot where we burn everything up and set up camp. Well, now, that all this is, was considered on the front lines, was it not? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we was, we was, uh, we, we, our sector, we, we controlled it, the sector between North and Da Nang. Sagan is way down there. Yeah. We up North, we up, we keep the enemy from coming in. Yeah. The hardcore enemy. You know, most yes. of the time they fought, we fought, uh, they had black pajamas on, which yeah. we didn't know. They was, just, everybody had wore black pajamas. You know, black we call pajamas, yeah. but they all right. black all the time. Yeah. But so when we went out on the oh, trolls good. and stuff like that, we fought the hardcore. Khakis, regular army, North Vietnamese army. Uh -huh. So that's why we would go out on these patrols to watch and make sure they couldn't come in. Uh -huh. And if I, we see something going on, like if I went out on a day patrol, if I see something that I know I can't, there ain't no way I can handle it with no 10, 11 guys, then I call in airstrikes, do, you know, hit them better way. Uh -huh. okay. You know, I was good at that. Yeah. One, one thing I was good at, and other than that, you know, we sometimes would go up in the mountains and had to fight and. Well, that that was so important, those car calling in those airstrikes, because you had to give longitude and latitude yeah. and all kinds of. Oh yeah, uh, you 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 uh, you had to make some direct hits. You couldn't wait, you know, on that, uh, especially with the with the what what. What I was calling in, because most of the time I had, when I did my call in, I didn't call in the artillery from the from the other men. I called in the air. Yeah. I called in a jet. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, if they couldn't get it, and if, they, if 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 the navy couldn't get it, then I called. If they couldn't hit me, I called in the jets. But I didn't call up our stuff, because I want the enemy to know that we hitting you hard. We don't, you don't know what's going on because we hit you with them 155. They know. Oh, that's just coming from the from the base. They don't even know who we is. They just popping and hitting. Yeah. But when you get hit from them jets up there. That's a sure target, and when we hit in, then we we destroy. We we get you in. So that was one of the, one of the, I got a uh, I got a meritorious unit citation for that. Yes, I can see why, <clears throat> because you saved a lot of lives. But yeah. but uh, and and you're giving accurate information because a mm -hmm. lot of people have gotten killed by friendly fire. Yes, that's right. And so you oh, had yeah. the safety of all those men uh, in your hands. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, it was I, it was a quite went, I went I went through at least five different operations we call them uh, you know conflicts mm -hmm. you know you know you got names you know they yes. got you know names that you done you know Sydney I got most of the info I got most of everything that I did uh, uh, some of, some of my stuff and some of the people other people and. Uh, Especially when I went to my reunion out there, I, I met a lot of guys that were, I could hardly, I could remember some things, and some things I used to always, I just couldn't put it together, but I was able to put a lot of things together once I met some of the guys out there, and I, it wasn't, wasn't me just thinking about it, right. it, was, it was it was the real deal. Well now, were you a professional, did you stay in, or were you? Or no ma'am, I stayed in three years. Okay, and how long were you in Vietnam? Uh, I was in Vietnam a year and probably a month, about a month. Normally, Marines normally stay a year and 30 days or 20 days, okay. they call it. And then did, you, did they cycle you out and then cycle you back in, or? Uh, well, what I did is, uh, uh, I didn't even know what, I didn't even know what day it was when I got ready to come home. I didn't even, I was out in the field. I was on operation. I just get a call, say, hey, it's time to go home. And I just, you know, I just, you know, if you don't catch that jeep going into the name, you had to wait till the next day to kick get out. So because they, you had certain runs that they would make, and so I just took off running, dropping everything I had. I left everything I had and jumped on that truck, and and I came home and I knocked on the door, December tenth, nineteen sixty-eight. I got shot December tenth, nineteen sixty-seven. Wow. Knocked on my door. 
right at home, and nobody knew I was there, coming. Wow. My mom, they was all shocked. Oh. But I was, I, I made it home. Yeah. And that's how I came home. One, just one soldier at a time. Yeah, that's right. We didn't, we didn't come with no one. We just say, hey, it's time for you to go, and you took off, and that was it. Yeah. I, I want, before we get into all that, I want, I want to ask you too about when you were over there. Uh, did you make rank? Oh uh, uh, yes, the, uh, I made, I made rank probably every three months. I was make, I was. When I left, I was a corporal. Uh -huh. In, in, a, I made three ranks in, in a year's time. In Vietnam. Yes, ma'am. Which is the highest as a enlisted man, the staff sergeant, so high, sergeant. Uh, it's it's it's, it's six you more get. you can get. I just that's just a start there. What I got. Oh. Staff sergeant is just uh, E six. Oh. Okay. It go up to E nine. Oh okay. Yes. All right. So so you got one day they said you're going home, and you just drop everything literally and run and jump on the truck. Mm -hmm. Uh, not time to say goodbye or anything to your buds or um, no, not so, and then coming home and your mom just there you are. How I I mean I can't imagine emotionally you're going from war to over here rock and roll and and it was and everything. How, how was how did you deal with that uh, emotionally? My my mom she she did it pretty good, but you know because I. You know, when they came, when I got wounded, uh, they came to the house, you know, yes. uh, with a telegraph. They didn't know what, if I was dead, what. Normally, you know, when you come to the home, you're dead. Right. But they, I wasn't, and I got to, matter of fact, I got all that right there, the telegraph. And so, by me doing what I did and getting back and going back in the unit and you know, doing that, I get wounded a second time, and I end up in Guam, in the hospital there for a month. Oh my goodness! And and then they sent me back to Vietnam. <laughs> so I went when I when they lived when I went to Guam. I, I went. I had time to get my stuff together, so I got everything I had and I shipped it home. My pictures and stuff, a lot of the pictures that I had yeah. earlier, and then. Uh, 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 when I came back from Guam, I met a guy from Nickton, another guy from Nacogdoches, and we got the best buds and best friends. And and when I came back, I could have went anywhere in Vietnam, but I just happened to look up that day and look up, and I saw one of the one of the first sergeants, high-ranking, you know, office uh, uh -huh. non-commissioned officer, which is what we call. Yeah. Uh, and I said, hey, I'm, you know, hey, I'm back. He said, I didn't have no orders, but I was getting ready to get, get orders. He, uh -huh. said, he, he said, I, won't, I don't want to go nowhere else. I want to come back. I want, I want to go back, you know, to my place where I know I'm used to, like, like home. Right, exactly. And so he said, come on, jump on. We'll get your orders when we get back. So I got back. And when I came back, I got back in the unit, and everybody started calling me first sergeant then. Uh, and they put me in charge of, of, the, of the squad, the whole squad then. And because I had the experience and stuff, and they knew, they knew, and all these guys here was just getting there, some of them. And so I was, I had my own hooch, and I was in charge of the cooks. So they get up in the morning, I make sure they get up and go cook before anybody else get up. And so I had my squad, and I was in heaven then. I was back home, and I... <laughs> well, you, you were the executive of the barracks. Oh, and I, would, the, yeah, I was yeah. I was one of the top guys there that's been there as long as they uh, most guys were getting wounded or killed. Yeah. They wasn't staying that long. I was there for a long time in that area, and especially well, by coming back, I was you know thing was you know coming down a little bit, but I was still I still knew where I was at. I could I could go to villages. I could I could go into a spot and I could just like. You know, map. I could go there and spot, and I could call in stuff just like that because I knew where I was at. I already knew the numbers. I didn't have to look. I could look at a bill, a, a, a section, or whatever, and I could call it in. I could just. I was just. I mean, I just got. I got really intense in what I had to do because it was life or death. Yeah. And I didn't get none of my squad, none of my men in my squad, wounded or killed. Congratulations. That's something to be proud of. And I got back and I got that whole squad, nobody. But at, before, 
we had a lot of guys that get killed and, you know with me side by side until when I came back and it was a little different story because like I say I was in charge and I would do more training and I would go out and I would you know teach teach the guys what to look for and everything because I was I was experienced I was very experienced well you were and uh, and that was just that was just kind of a happened so it wasn't really planned by no, the top no, brass or no, anything. No, I was I was just nineteen years old. I mean I I had to train lieutenants. Mm -hmm. You know, young boot lieutenants just like we are when they just get there and they come there they they have to come out in the field to get a get a rank. Yeah. They have to come through us. Yeah. And I I told some, you know, hey don't do do don't don't do that. Got killed. Because they didn't listen, because they wanted to be a lieutenant. Right. And you don't just be a lieutenant because you want to be one. You in an area where the people, you know, and all, you know, what what happened was he, we told him not to go in that area, but he's inquisitive. He sees something shining. He's going to go over there and pick it up, mm. see what it was, you know. So that's what it was. It was a booby trap. Wow. And so you just you don't you don't go in the area. You stay with your, you know you had certain things you had to do, and you know you don't just. Sh do that out in the open because the enemy knows that you're a higher ranking person by one in a way yeah. and so you had to learn you know you, so we I think what's his name Rob come through us Lyndon Johnson grandson really mm -hmm. he was in your unit mm -hmm. huh yeah. when he come when he when he first lieutenant when he came in and got his ranking they come out for six months and then that's it and they go back mm -hmm. you know so they don't let them stay long, but they don't they don't go on too many patrols, but they go out on operations yeah. that we have. Now how, how different is operations from patrols? What, what's the Operation difference? mean everybody. You don't you got you getting Marines from helicopters, you getting everything together, Amtrak's and what you're gonna have to make a swoop, like I say, or surround an area and kill everybody in there. Yeah. Tag them, yeah. identify them. Make sure that they're not the enemy. So when you go through that village again, that you can identify them again. Yeah. And we was we was we had to do that in that area at that time because this was 1967 doing Tet right after Tet, mm -hmm. and after Tet that's when we had to do all that because that Tet time is when they sneak in, and they don't go back. They sneak in in khakis and hide the khakis and get the black on, and go in the little villages and make you come join me. Oh, they were infiltrating yeah. the villages. Right. Kind of like what ISIS is doing now. Yeah, wow. And so, and and that was probably one of the more, uh, uh, the tougher places to fight, wasn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, right up there. On yeah, the it line. was be because, you know, it's once you once you're in an area, the we the the people are still living. They still in the areas and. and they got rice paddies and they you know they doing their thing. Not, it's not a city where we we out in the, you know, we further out, but they are also out. And living in the flatlands. Yeah. Then once we get up to the mountains, no, they don't. They can't nobody live up in there. They can't even live up in there. Mm -hmm. But they can dig tunnels and stuff like that. You know, which is what they was doing. But uh, uh, they more or less out in the opening. And uh, I get I get confused on what I'm saying. I, a lot of times. Now, what were we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about we were talking about those Vietnamese and and oh, yeah. how you we were fighting. Yeah, yeah, they uh, and and like I say, we had the little villages, and we we have to go into those villages. And so for some reason, I don't know if I did something wrong or what happened to me, but I got I got sent to one of those units, which is, which is called a CAP unit, a Combined Action, which is all Vietnamese ran eight soldiers, and they own little each little village at night they. They tie off the roads where nothing can come through, and they stay in that village. And then the, the Vietnamese soldiers guard that little village at night. Wow. Then we come in as advisors to watch them and make sure they fight okay. if if enemy get to them. And so that's you know, remember that uh, that guy, the little short guy, what's his name? That was a uh, spoke at the Mike Taylor. No, he wasn't. He was a he was a he was a real short one. He had his he had his he had his ribbons on up here. I don't remember. He was he was in he was a uh, he was in one of those units. Oh really? He was assigned permanent to one. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, yes, that's, that's 
In other words, he had to speak Vietnamese. You had to, you, had, you eat, you ate what they ate. You did everything they did, like a Vietnamese. Huh. Yeah, yeah. When I saw him, I went up and talked to him, and I said, well, you, "Cap, they call him a cap. Come by in action. That's that ribbon root. That's that ribbon right here." Okay. Okay. And that's the Meritorious Unit. That's this one here. Come back, action ribbon. Huh. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, um, how did let's think about just a minute uh, your friendships that were you were formed that were formed uh it sounds like you had a lot of good friends uh, i've had a, quite a few good friends i matter of fact from vietnam i haven't spoken to anyone except one guy he's dead now mm -hmm. from that from vietnam that i knew mm -hmm. and uh how about when uh, you're um, keeping in touch with your family? How you how were you able to do that? Oh, I wrote every day. Oh, you did. <laughs> look like. Yeah. Yeah, I look like I did because I I mean I've got the letters, boy, letters, letters, letters. Mm hmm And if I didn't write a letter home, I wrote it to someone else's uh, sister or brother that was in the unit. We we wrote each other letters. We took somebody just in your family because. We, you yeah. had to we, or wanted no, to? No, we just did it. We just did it because that was that was something that we just formed ourselves. We just started doing. You know, if you had a sister or brother, you know, more or less a sister. Right. We were right to we were right to the sister. Right. You know. And then what were did you ever have any off duty time? Uh yes, we the the off duty time was uh it was we had off duty times. So we could we could sometimes sit around and drink beer. Right. And or, you know, right there on the on the base. Uh, well, we didn't call it the base, <laughs> called the hill. Right. And uh, we would we would uh, get time off. Or we had uh, at one time we had a someone came there to uh, for the officers, I think. Yeah. And uh, we put on a show over there and said, Hey, can you, why can't you guys come and be with us for a while? And next thing we know, a couple of ladies was over there dancing taking pictures with all the guys and stuff one was black and one was uh, i think she was uh she was uh i say malaysian or, you know uh -huh. but she had a she was doing that hula hoop thing you know that whatever you call that <laughs> and then so guys were taking pictures you know and stuff like that with them and everything that that boosted the morale a lot i'm sure <laughs> yes that you know that, yeah we took pictures like i said and everything and so they i don't know how long they was with us about 10 or 20 minutes but it wasn't long yeah but we we had we did that and uh i think every once in a while we got a chance to go in and watch to the dane and watch tv oh a movie big movie oh. yeah they had a movie theater oh, okay. for the for the navy you know, no. right. <laughs> you know so if we got a chance to go in we snuck in we want to go in and see a movie <laughs> And after that, but we also had a, I think a one week of R and R, we call it rest and relaxation. Yeah. And what did you get to do during that time? I went to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Oh, okay. Yeah, I went there from what, you know, saw the koala barrels and the rubber trees How and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, okay. So, uh, when you were able, when you came home, you said. Um, that uh, they just called you and then you got on the truck and went home. But uh, did you, um, where were you when the war ended? When the war ended, uh, I was in California, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I was in California at, uh, I was out of service. Oh, okay. Yes, I was out of service. I got out of service in 1970. Okay. Of May. And I think the war didn't end to 1975, I think. Oh, okay. So, w when you when you went over there, did, you didn't go as a group? No. You we went one single people just, we went, we didn't go as a unit. Yeah. And then did you come yeah. back home as an individual? No. Yes, we came back home the same as we went. Just as a com on a commercial flight? Yes, on a commercial continental airline. Really? Yes, okay. from from uh, from the uh, from Vietnam to Philippines. I mean, to Vietnam to Okinawa, and then from Okinawa back to uh, uh, California. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I know your mom was 
and family, I know they were thrilled to see you, but how about the rest of the community? How were you accepted? Uh, I didn't, uh, I wasn't here probably about a couple of weeks yeah. before I was uh, sent to California to be stationed there. And we was, it was okay because as long as we were around Camp Pendleton, they knew we was Marines. Yes. But once you left there and you went up to Los Angeles, uh-huh. you was treated a little different. Yeah. We, matter of fact, uh, we couldn't go on on liberty unless we wore military shoes. Oh, you had to wear military shoes? Yes. That way they could identify us if we got in trouble because most of us couldn't even drink. We wasn't 21, but we had been to Vietnam. Yeah. So they let us drink if we wore our shoes. Really? How interesting. You've been drinking beer over there and shooting. And, oh, my goodness. Okay. So uh, the, the, I, I'm, I'm just stunned by what you all had to endure. You were doing war and getting having you know booby traps and all this one day and the next day you're back over Mm -hmm. here and as i said to one person uh, over here the country's rocking and rolling and Mm -hmm. and being all hating vietnam war and all that kind of stuff so how how was that how were you able to deal with that Uh, adjustment it it never was a problem uh with me too much um because when I grew up here in Lufkin, my last two years was at an all-white school. So I was one of the first blacks to graduate out of uh, Redland High School. Oh, really? And by going to Redland and being around white people, uh-huh. as we would call it, and growing up, seeing the signs say colored only and white only, you know, I had to go through all of that when I was growing up. But when I went to that school out in Redland, it was like we was like just brothers and sisters. Mainly because we all grew up together. I knew most of the kids out there because I grew up in the country. I was closer to Redland than I were Lufkin. Right. So I knew a lot of the people and my dad knew most of everybody. Right. And so it wasn't a problem getting along with anyone. And uh, in military in the, in, over in Vietnam, uh, they had uh, units separated by race. They did? In Vietnam, yes. You know, you couldn't stay in there. You know, only white could go in that in there, blacks in this one. And you might be in that squad when you go out on patrol, but you can't sleep in there. Huh. So, that didn't bother me because you know, we want to be with our, we want to be together anyway. You know, most people, you know, it was all right with us. Right. You know, and we had our six, 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 certain guys would go here, certain guys would go there. Everybody had their own clique. Although we was all black, but I didn't do what some of the other blacks did. Right. They didn't do what some of the, you know other people did. So right. it was just like, hey, you know, you go around there, you hang around with those guys. You, we know what y'all do. You hang around, you know. So you, I didn't hang around. I I socialized with everybody. See, right. so I was able to, I was able to get through it uh, real, real, real fun. And and uh, some of the guys uh, was forced into it, and they didn't really want to do it yeah. in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And then when they got back to the states, you know, it wasn't no more that, hey brother, none of that, because they was, they were in Vietnam, right. so they couldn't do that out in public. Right. And so that was a big problem for for a while. We did have some race riots uh, at Camp Pendleton in '69. Oh, really? Yeah, because of uh, because of some of the things that was going on, and uh, uh, it didn't. I didn't participate in anything, but it was it were going on. Yeah. And uh, when I got out in 1970, I came home. And, you know, California was different, but I didn't, I love California, but I still hadn't been spending no time at home with my, my family. Right. And so I came home in May and got a job at the paper mill, you know, best job in Lufkin. And uh, 
So then, but in September, my mom passed. Uh-huh. You know, and the following year, my little brother got killed. Uh-huh. So I couldn't take it. I had to get out of here. I just I couldn't. I want to be the one to go. I didn't want, you know, I, it, why didn't, wasn't it me? That's the only thing I kept saying. Why wasn't it me? I had, you know, it should have been me. I shouldn't be here. Yeah, because you'd been wounded. I didn't twice. want to see them. I didn't, yeah. I don't know, why should I have to stay here and see them die? I, you know, so yeah. it, it took a toll on me and I left and went back to California. And it was rough because I couldn't get no job. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't hire us. We was Vietnam veterans. Couldn't go to school. I used to walk the street with my head down, just looking for anything I could find. Mm. And I finally went to upholstery school in 1972. In 1973, I, I, I started working, and I never did stop. I never was out of job. I went to school for the upholstery. I worked in furniture, new furniture. I've been a mailman. I've been an aircraft sheet metal mechanic. Uh, I upholstered aircraft. Uh, retired from San Quentin State Prison as a teacher, yeah. teaching teaching kids, kids guys how to sew on sewing machines and make shoes. Well, good so I, to me, I, I, I accomplished a lot. You did, you did, and you and, and you did whatever it took. Yes, I I did whatever it took. I I was. A, Plus, you were mentally strong. Yes, yes, I, I was. I was very, very, my father was very, my family, you know, all my, you know, my peers, brothers and sisters, you know, we was all, you know, all strong people, you know, right. all God-fearing people, you know. Absolutely. We, so, it helped us a lot. It helped me. It still helps me, so I don't, I don't have to stop. Yeah. So, how, uh, how did these, um, well, I need to ask you about this first. The, uh, do you ever see any of your fellow veterans? Do you ever have you ever run into them or kept in touch with them over the years? Or I, I haven't ran into anyone. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm on the verge of uh, trying to find some people now that are. Uh, I contacted our organization, uh-huh. and uh, so they have a list of a, a lot of the people that are. That I can, I've been kind of leery of doing it because you don't want to stay up to any things. And I contacted one guy, and uh, he didn't call me back. Mm. His, his wife did and said he was kind of sick. Yeah. And one day he called, but I wasn't around. Yeah. And I never, it's been a year, I never called him back because I've just felt like that it's probably something there. You know, he's going through some, you know, some, some things, and uh, so. I didn't really want to push it because, you know, if a person want to really talk to you, they will make contact. Right. And so I'm the one that initiated it, but he, you know, because she said, he, she, yeah, she, he remember you, you know. And so, but other than that, I don't know, see, so, but there's only one guy, and he's, he's a very famous guy, too. Huh. He's, you know, he's, he's in a lot of magazines, a lot of books. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, do you um, do you belong to any uh, veterans organizations? I belong to the Marine Corps League here in Lufkin. Good, good. Okay, and then how would you say that these uh, wartime experiences have affected your life? Uh, well, they have affected my life in a lot of different ways, but, you know, I look back on it and I wouldn't take it, nothing for it because I... To me, I've grown stronger, stronger than I were before. Uh, I've been through a whole lot, but I don't, I don't let nothing, you know, pull me back because I try to, I try to stay positive. It's what I do. I, I try to stay positive. I, if I don't, then I know it, it can, it can get me down. It, and I have, I have went through some, some, some terrible times. Yeah. But, you know, I, I'm on a lot of medication, mm-hmm. you know, and so it's no way I can sleep at night without taking it because if I don't, I can't go to, I can't go to sleep the next day because yeah. I'm going to stay up all night right. and then I'm going to have nightmares. And so I, 
I avoid that by taking the medication. I got the right type of medication, so. But uh, it's, uh, you know, I've, I still have a lot of, a lot of problems, but like I say, I try not to, I try to do dwell on as much, but I, I've learned to, if I can get to talk to another veteran, mm -hmm. you know, which uh, the Marine Corps League we have here, I think it's maybe one or two more guys that Vietnam veterans. Mm -hmm. But I, so far, I think I'm the only one in there that's really been through a lot of combat. Yeah. And, uh, but we got some Korean guys, this Purple Horse, you know, all the guys, but uh -huh. it's not that many of us in there. Mm -hmm. And so, I've, like I say, I've, I've dealt with a lot of guilt from some of the things that we did, you know, and I, I it, it, it'll come to me, you know, a lot of times, and I just have to, you know, just, 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 just go to something else, you know, just, I, I, I try not to, to dwell on too much anything, you know, but like my best buddy, you know, when he, I mean, I, for years and years, I just, it's just like me and him talking, just like me and you talking right now. I wake up the next day and I say, man, we had a good conversation and stuff, you know. Then it hit me that it wasn't real. Yeah. That was a dream. Yeah. Something, you know, I mean, I was, it was just like, it was just like real, real, real. But it took a long time for that to, you know. And so I, I dealt with a lot of that and a lot of, you know, I went, I, I, my last wife, she, she was 49 years old. She just, just mm. like that one evening, had a seizure. Oh, she was make, taking medication from a back, back surgery that she had. And so, you know, to, to deal with a lot of, you know, death and stuff like that, I don't, you know, I just, I don't know, just knock on wood, just say, yeah, I feel good, I'm, I'm still here, just, you know, sometimes I just wonder how I made it, you know, you know how, why, you know, why, you know, why me, you know, but. I appreciate you coming in and talking to us so much. I it's appreciate uh, so, um, I know this is hard because it takes you back to a lot of things yeah, that you don't like to talk about. But I'm so honored to get to talk with you and meet you and, and know how strong you are. Mm -hmm. And I uh, just appreciate you so much. Thank you. You're welcome.